uh, let's pray and then we'll, we'll get into our passage today. Loving God, we want to thank you for the opportunity to get into your word again, uh, to see what you have um, just kept there for us. You've inspired James to write this instructional letter to us about how we should live and now we pray as we, as we delve into it that your Holy Spirit would um, enliven our hearts to the truth that it wants to tell us, uh, that our lives would be conformed and transformed uh, to the way that you would have us live. Um, and Lord, if we need to be convicted about something and to, and to come into a right relationship with you around these things, we pray that as your word and your Holy Spirit work in our hearts, uh, that that would take place as well. And we give you thanks for your word. Um, amen. Well, <clears throat> we are coming to the end of our time in James. I think next week is our last message of James and then the week after that we've got Mother's Day so um, I'm just going to pick a mum on that day randomly to come up and preach the message for us just to see uh, how that goes I'm not really going to do that so turn up it's, it's not I don't even know why I said that uh, I just wanted to see the look on your faces to see if you were paying attention oh man oh I better start thinking what does Jesus say about being a mum um, anyway in our letter now, James is, is, is shifting back. This morning he's shifting back to what uh, life in, amongst the Christian community of believers should look like. All through this letter, James has been on about if genuine faith exists uh, within you personally and it's there in amongst the, the Christian community, then we should expect to see some kind of ground uh, level evidence of it. Uh, and the evidence of that, James has called the evidence of that that we find working its way to grand level, he has called that works. And we have seen throughout this book that these works are works of our hands, like what we would we do towards others, our deeds, and they're also uh, works of our hearts, what God is, is doing in our heart and working on our heart, works of repentance, works of transformation, works of how we think about people, how we feel towards others. Faith is working, genuine faith is working on our heart as well as our hands in order that we might become instruments in the hands of the Redeemer, that we might become instruments of, of grace and mercy and justice and peace and compassion and fairness. Like we, we've been reading about that through this letter. These are the works of genuine faith. Genuine faith is not just a set of kind of pious uh, principles or religious practice. It's, it's street-level relationships of grace and growth. Uh, they're external and they're internal kind of redemptive transformation from sin. And we saw last week, though, that James stepped out of this Christian community, uh, out of the community of uh, believers, and he took aim at the unjust uh, rich. He took aim at their unspiritual, ungodly wastage and their self-indulgence when it came to wealth. And, he, and the fact that these people had actually gained their wealth uh, but through exploiting the poor or ignoring the poor and, and, and coming to their aid. And so James was counselling um, them in that to, to those that were on the actual receiving end of the unjust rich to say, you know what, don't be envying these people because of their wealth and, and don't be jealous of them in any way or angry about their practices because they're not storing up wealth. They're actually storing up judgment. Um, their wealth is going to rot and, and fade away. And the only thing that they are storing up really is this terrifying day of accountability. They're, this terrifying day of the justice of God coming. So now James returns to how Christians are to live in light of that. Now that they've been told about that. What does the work of genuine faith look like at a street level while they are now living with the expectations of God's justice that it will come? And they have the answer. James gives them the answer. They are to have an attitude and a posture of patience. Genuine faith works patiently in trust of God. And James ties that command to the promise of the, the coming of the Lord. Now, the use of the name Lord here means that James has in view not just some eschatological return of God when he ties all things up, but the literal return of Jesus into time and space. That's how James has been using the word Lord through his letter. 
The return of Jesus is a very well-established event in the early church. It's based on the testimony of Jesus himself. He spoke about it in Mark 13. He spoke about it in Matthew 24, 25 and Luke 18. The angels attested to the return of Jesus at his ascension there at the beginning of Acts. You know, why are you fools sitting around looking at the stars and the skies and all that thing? You know, Jesus is going to come back just in the same manner that he left. And, and the attestation, if you like, to, to the well-knownness, if that's a word, of the return of Jesus is seen in the fact that there are over 300 references to the return of the Lord in the New Testament. So if you kind of divide that up, that would be one reference every 13 verses. The return of Jesus is what shaped the activity of the early church, of first believers. They were, they were not just sitting around uh, all, all checked out from life, uh, disengaged because, you know, they had their salvation all sorted. They were just waiting for the return of the Lord to come. They were actually engaged with the world, engaged with culture because the Lord was returning. They were living with a genuine faith that would actually be used as the evidence for their inclusion in the kingdom of God when it finally eventuated, eventuated when, it, when it turned up at this fixed point of time that's approaching Jesus himself had said in Luke 18 that he would bring justice to the elect, this justice that they're waiting for, and it would not be held up, that it would come, nothing's going to delay it. But the question was, would he find faith on the earth? Would he find people who are still living obediently amongst the injustice of the world, not losing heart because of it, but standing firm in their faith? You know, apart from the resurrection of Jesus, the return of Jesus is the most referenced event in the New Testament. What is of little um, contention, if you like, is the when of that event. Uh, and Jesus says that only the Father knows. So it shouldn't really be contentious. We just need to rest in the fact that it's there. God knows about it. So it's a fixed date. It's not a case of, could it happen any time? Who knows when it's going to happen? That's not it at all. It's a case of it will happen in time. So, so live accordingly. Live knowing that there's a fixed date when Jesus is coming back. Our job is not to run around and go, oh, war in Syria. What are the Chinese doing? Or, you know, oh, I see the Antichrist over there. That's not our job to try and work out, oh, what are the signs when Jesus is coming back? That's, we're not mythbusters. We're Christians living with the knowledge that Christ is returning and therefore, regardless of what's happening in the world, we should live accordingly. And it's with this in mind that the New Testament writers describe the return of Christ as near or soon or at hand. It's a done deal. And we see James do that right there in verse 8. The coming of the Lord is at hand. It's, it's near. And some have taken that to mean that they assumed that it would happen literally soon, like in their lifetimes. And, and maybe they're a bit confused, but I don't think so. I think the best way to interpret what is meant by near is that there is now nothing stopping the return of Jesus. Nothing but grace stopping Jesus from coming back. It's a fixed event that is approaching and it's near with respect to salvation history. There is nothing else that needs to happen. The work of salvation is complete. It's been completed by the death and the resurrection of Jesus. There's no more events that need to take place so, so God can you know, finish up the universe and establish his kingdom apart from a period of grace. Only grace remains. So live accordingly. Peter gives us the best description of this in his letter in 2 Peter 3, 8 to 9. He says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God's timetable is different to ours. And he's not impatient about that timetable or looking for shortcuts or, 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 or anything like that. He just has a different approach to time than what we have because we experience it differently. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is 
patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God himself is patient about the return of, of Jesus. Patient towards sinners. He's not like, I'm done with you fools. It's time to wrap this show up. No, he is patient. It's his loving kindness that allows for this, this period of time before the returning of Christ. The use of the word near or at hand describes the return of Jesus is not some kind of you know, you know, cruel, uh, intangible motivation like, oh, who knows, who knows, just keep, keep you know, hanging in there. That's not what they have in mind. They're actually describing the kindness of God. He's patient on executing his justice. Jesus will return, so know that that day of justice is coming. But there is still a time while we wait that people might encounter a different kind of justice, that they might repent and turn to Jesus. That is a truth that should fuel the activity of our patience and give us a purposeful passion, if you like, as we wait for the coming of the Lord. Our, act, our activity of patience should be the means through which people see and encounter uh, the grace of God in our lives. We wait patiently. Knowing that, knowing that um, we wait patiently, knowing that God is patiently moving towards this glorious end. And we wait purposefully, obediently joining in God's redemptive mission to, to be agents of justice in this period of grace. Peacemakers, caring for the widow and the orphan, making disciples of people through the message and the works, the symptoms of the gospel. This is the truth that we need to establish our hearts in. This is what we need to stand firm in. That's the work of a faith that works patiently in a world of injustice. Now, that could be the end of the sermon. I could kick you out of here. You could go home, and James could have done that too. But he knows that you need some sort of examples to help you out with that. So he gives us the example of a farmer to help us out with the fact that patience is not the absence of activity. It's not just sitting around and waiting. Patience is exercised through a process, a process of, of trust. Patience is purposeful activity that expects a harvest. That's what we're reading here in this little analogy. In this case, it's waiting for the justice of God. The farmer knows that there are seasonal events. That's how God has designed the world to run. And while the exact time and expression are out of the farmer's control... He's still diligent and purposeful in his farming. James says, see how. See how the farmer waits. It's, it's, it's active waiting. You know, I've never met an inactive farmer. They are constantly following a, a well-maintained process uh, developed through their relationship with the seasonal patterns and the land and all this kind of stuff. For example, Anzac Day is traditionally the marker for rain. Farmers know that they need rain by now uh, to get enough moisture into the soil because, you know, they've got to be able to sow their crops soon. So we need moisture in the soil. And, and Anzac Day is traditionally the day where we need to have some good rain, the early rain, into the soil so that the seeds can go in and they germinate and they grow in time for the later rains around September, August, that's going to, you know, push the crop towards being harvested. In between these Things, they're not just sitting around watching Netflix. They're out killing weeds, fertilizing soil, uh, fences, you know, fixing fences, shooting vermin, getting the local pig shooters in to clean up all the mess, that kind of thing. They are in this patient process. They don't try and force things, they purposefully cultivate the environment in order to get the harvest. And James is saying that's how we are to be. A patience that purposefully cultivates our environment. A patience that, that, that waits for justice, a harvest of justice, while practicing you know, justice, mercy, kindness, and love ourselves. Like a farmer practices his farming um, practices. Patience, you see, is no passive posture. It's a lifestyle of kindness, of generosity, of, of impartiality, of truthfulness, of love. Love for God, love for our brothers and sisters, concern and love for our neighbours. 
all of that James has covered throughout this book. This is what James has been calling the work of a genuine faith. And now he says that work is what we are calling the posture of patience. It, it nurtures and demonstrates uh, redemptive justice, if you like, while we wait for judicial justice. Like there's a day coming when justice is going to be executed. But while we're waiting for that, we're out practicing a different kind of justice, justice that restores and redeems what is all messed up. And James is not merely taking an example from farming practices or appealing to nature. He's also making a theological point connected to Deuteronomy 11, that God himself is the faithful one. He's faithful to keep his promises to those who are not double-minded, and we've seen that throughout the letter of James, but are solely devoted to him, serving him with their, all their heart, with all their soul. And in one of the descriptive lines that we get back there is one of the ways that we know God is faithful is because of the regularity of the seasons that he has created. Now, patience is not achieved or exercise through our ability to, to muster it up and perform it. It's a product. It's, we stand firm in it because we are trusting God. It's a product of having encountered God's patience with you. The farmer does what he does because of his relationship with God. That's the picture of the farmer in this passage. James says, establish your heart of patience in the goodness of God. Stand firm in whom God is. Let that establish how you practice patience in this world with people, with injustice, with each other. Or just as the farmer has many enemies, the farmer has drought and flood, the frost, vermin, all this kind of stuff, patience has an enemy. And James names it here and he says that the enemy of patience is grumbling. Now you might not think grumbling is too big a deal. After all, we all grumble. We probably start the day that way. We get out of bed, oh man, got to go to work. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Oh, oh, the dishes are still in the sink. Oh, dishes didn't get washed last night. Oh, grumble, grumble, grumble. Stupid train crossings are, are down again. I can't even get across the Nepean Highway. Grumble, grumble, grumble. That's how we cope with life, right? That's what we do. That's the legit way to deal with life, isn't it? Grumble, grumble, grumble. Wrong, says James. Grumbling is a posture of the heart that is the opposite to patience. Grumbling reveals pettiness and harshness, jealousy, self-pity. It, it's saying, that I am the most important person. It's, it's self-absorption. It's like, why aren't you doing this for me? Why is the world against me? Grumbling is the enemy of patience because rather than being an agent of grace, it's the agent of division. It's the agent of discord. It looks across the room and, and, and asks, why aren't my needs being met? How could my needs be being met? Rather than looking across the room and saying, how do I move towards meeting the needs of others? How do I show patience towards people who make me want to grumble? Oh, look, there's some dishes I could do. How wonderful would it be if Sandy woke up and went, oh man, those dishes, and there they were all clean and sparkly. Grumbling eats away at our peace and invites us to take out our frustration on each other. It's a practice run. Grumbling is a practice run for venting our discontent with others. What you grumble about, you will eventually practice. There is nothing more miserable than not being able to get out of your own perceived lack of unmet needs it's destructive to you and it's destructive to others grumbling is like that lump that becomes a cancer that will eventually kill the community so every time you go to grumble hit pause exercise patience instead loving kindness generosity these, these things that James has been talking about the whole way through this letter but what is most concerning about grumbling is, is that it is an attitude of the heart that says, well, actually, you know more about this situation. You know this situation better than God does, that you could handle it better. And so you grumble. Grumbling is you expressing what you feel justice looks like as far as you're concerned, what you would have done in this situation had you had control of the universe. Grumbling is a lack of trust in God. 
It's to forget who God is. It's a failure to be patient for His justice to come into your life. It's a failure to remember His grace towards you and the withholding of justice that He could have meted out on you that you actually deserved. The cure for the cancer of grumbling is to remember the patience of God towards someone as irritating as you. How much patience has God exercised toward you? That, as you think about that, should melt your heart with gratitude, not grumbling. And and then that becomes the motivation about how you move towards others. James reminds his listeners that grumbling is an attitude of the heart that's not concealed from God. The image of the judge, the one who brings justice, standing at the door, is used to convey again the nearness of God who, who, who hears and sees and, 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 and the displeasure that he would have in overhearing our grumbling toward each other rather than our patience. Well, James now doubles down and supplies Two more examples of what a posture of purposeful patience looks like. The prophets are used in a general sense and then Job is used in particular. The prophets are put forward as a picture of how to be patient under testing conditions. You know, people that are irritating you or people that are unjust towards you, this kind of thing. They are a picture of what standing firm looks like. Rather than grumble, they go and they spoke the name of the Lord. They went obediently out and lived as God asked them to live. They lived in obedience and trust to God. And now, as we reflect back on the lives of the prophets and how they patiently worked out their faith, we, we're in awe of them. Like they're the, the pin-up boys of the Old Testament, aren't they? We consider them to be blessed, their lives to be blessed. How much was God involved in their lives sort of thing? Because of their endurance, because of their ability to be faithful to God. And and, and we kind of want to be like them a little bit. That's what James is saying here. The prophets are called to remind Christians that trials and sufferings uh, that they are currently experiencing are not novel. that, 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 That has been generation and generation of faithful people to God. And that those that have practiced faithful patience in in persecution and trying situations, they become the heroes of our faith. And And we find them listed in Hebrews 11. The prophets are mentioned towards the end there. James doesn't give us the names of any specific prophet. However, we can think of people like Isaiah, who God says to him, hey, go and preach my gospel you know, to, to the people. They are never, ever, ever going to believe a word you say. Your message will fall on deaf ears, and then at the end you're going to be sword in half, and that's going to be you. Go, get out and do that. Or, or Jeremiah. Babylonian invasion coming. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and, and, and enslave Israel, but he's going to be the instrument of God's chastening. Can you go and tell my people that? And they're like, no way, we're going to war. And they lose and they're enslaved. And then God says to Jeremiah, oh, just go and tell them that in their, um, you know, in their captivity that they are to live for the peace and the prosperity of their captors. And, like, they're, and they're like, no way, that, that sounds like treason to us. And yet Jeremiah faithfully living out this life that God has called him to. Hosea is another prophet. You know, you need to understand, Hosea, if you want to be my mouthpiece, you need to understand how I feel, what life is like for me as the God of, of adulterous people. Go and marry a woman, a prostitute, who will always be unfaithful to you, always be running away from you, and you will be constantly redeeming her back. The whole point is, as we listen to those crazy stories, is that faith, patient faith, is possible. What James is calling us to do is neither novel nor impossible, nor does it render us uh, un- incapable of serving. Like the prophets still served, they still lived out their faith. Nor does it render us incapable of witnessing. And maybe as we stand firm in our faith in trials, and, and, and suffering, uh, and we see each other's patience in that, we would then ourselves be encouraged by the patience of our brothers and sisters, and that would spur us along to love and good deeds. 
Finally, James turns to Job. Now, Job seems at first to be a bit of an odd choice. I thought it was a bit of an odd choice as I, as I thought, first look at it. Because we read the book of Job, Job does not come across as all that patient to me. In the book of Job, we find in Job demanding that God demonstrate his justice, give him a reason for what is happening to him. Job is like, man, what, what gives? I'm, a, I'm, I'm good. What's going on? After getting no sympathy from his wife, she said, won't you curse God and die? Thanks, honey. And his friends, Job takes his case to God. On what basis does good Job encounter trials of many kinds? Why is Job suffering? Where is the justice of God in all of this? He loses everything. Everything goes from Job's life. Where is the justice? What is God doing? And that answer never comes in the book. Rather, Job is taken on a virtual tour of the universe in which his understanding of how it runs, how the universe runs, is actually put up in comparison to the understanding that God has of the universe. You know, where were you when the foundations were laid? You know, in the mountains, do you feed goats and eagles like I do? That kind of thing. The point being that maybe there are some things that happen to us that that we wouldn't design in our limited knowledge of things, but that God is actually able to use what we wouldn't want to have as our environment, he is able to use for his purposes to bring us into an even greater faith and and an encounter with him where we actually now encounter the compassion and mercy of God. James has already said that the enduring of trials leads to the maturing of faith. That's the picture here. Job has challenged God's justice and God has responded that Job has too limited a knowledge of the universe to make such a claim. But here's the thing. God let Job do that. He let him come. He let him come to him in continuous prayer about the injustices that he felt he was feeling. And God patiently, patiently listened to Job. All of his accusations all of his questions. God asks Job in all of this to trust his character, to trust that maybe he is working all things for the good of those who love him, as Paul would have put it in Romans. Job's response at the end of the book is repentance and humility. And he actually apologizes for overstepping his, you know, his pay grade. Then the book concludes weird. It concludes with God rejecting Job's friend's simplistic explanation of how justice works and affirming Job and his understanding of God and justice. But we know that Job got stuff wrong. He had a limited view. So what is it that God approves? Job invited God into his situation. He invited God into the injustice. He wanted to wrestle his situation. He wanted to wrestle the injustice of his situation through with God. His friends rolled out their pious head knowledge. Job explored the pain of his heart due to the suffering and he wrestled with his understanding of God, his love, his justice. It's Job's impatient patience that we are to consider as a case study here. That's the right way to purposefully and patiently move through trials and suffering with honest prayer. We see it all through the Psalms. Not pious platitudes, but honest prayer. Job invites us to patiently trust the goodness of God in suffering through real prayer, not to, sim- not to, uh, to simplify God in any way, just to kind of see him as some cause and effect vending machine, not to accuse God of injustice based on our limited knowledge of our environment, to, but to bring our pain and our suffering to God and trust that even though our environment says something, God still cares and he knows what he's doing And based out of our knowledge of the fact that we know what God is doing, that is how we are to approach. Out of that, we can experience the the compassion and the mercy of God. It's not experienced in our material gain and comfort, but in the fact that God is actually with us in suffering, that God patiently listens to us. God is transforming our hearts not to be victims who rise up in retribution, rebellion or dissolve in despondency, but rather that in this, out of our experience of our suffering and things like that, we would become agents of grace who stand firm in their faith, patiently living out 
the lessons on kindness and justice and mercy and generosity towards others in a way that now redeems relationships rather than just joining in the cycle of injustice and grumbling. You know, that was the life that Jesus lived, led him to a cross where his life of justice would be exchanged for our lives of injustice. This is the life that he expects to find in us, patiently and purposefully living like that until he returns. Agents of unmerited redemptive justice. We become agents of justice in the world. People who, who would rather operate with grace than grumble towards people who would rather grumble than show grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again uh, for this, this little book of James and how it drills down into our hearts and gets into something so simple as a thing as patience, how we are to exercise patience in a way uh, that, that, that brings life to people, that brings, a, that brings redemptive justice, the restoring of things into people's lives rather than waiting for judicial justice to take place. We give you thanks uh, for this book again this morning. We pray that your spirit would take its truths and its words and apply them to our hearts, that we might be transformed to live uh, the lives that, uh, that it describes here. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.